This video is going to be a little bit different. We're not going outside to do the, the epic adventures that I normally do. I've been asking people to leave questions in the comment section below. And the idea is to actually answer those questions here in this video so that everybody has that information. Um, and remember, this is just my opinion, so don't take it personal and get upset about what I say. It's just my opinion. Uh, and this whole video format's not originally my idea. It's from one of my favorite YouTubers, a Swedish guitar player named Ola England, fantastic guy. Um, plays really heavy music, so if you don't like that kind of stuff, don't worry about it. But if you do, I'll put a link to his channel here and go check it out. And I don't think he watches what I do, but if he does, hey Ola, thanks for doing what you do. It's really cool stuff. Um, so with that, let's go ahead and get into the first question. And the first question ever in my question and answer video comes from David Valden. This is going to be fun trying to pronounce all of these names. Great video. How are you finding the Sony 200 to 600 long term? Well, since I've purchased the 600 F4, I rarely ever use the 200 to 600. There's not really anything wrong with it. I just like this much better. In fact, the 600 F4 uh, is in my bag at all times. When I would use this is if I was shooting the A9 and I needed the, uh, the ability to move from two to six. I actually use this a lot for shooting video. Question number two comes from Shaquille Ahmed Sourwar and it deals with the Nikon D500. His question was, sir, I have a question. Is there any issue with D500 for having lower resolution? I mean, isn't sharpness and detail good enough? The D500 is great for high resolution sharp images. This is a good example. This is a, a D500 shot I took years ago. It's one of my favorites. I keep it in my bedroom. It's a sandhill crane and the mom and her chick. Really good stuff. And I, this was actually cropped maybe, I'm gonna guess 30% out of the frame and I still had it printed this size. Granted, it's printed on canvas, which is a lower resolution, but yeah, the D500 is excellent uh, for prints. I have quite a few that I've gotten from it. And the third question comes from Tony Sun. Hi, Mark. It seems there are not a lot of bird in flight pictures taken by A7R4 body. Wonder how autofocus tracking out of this camera performs versus A9 or A92 on bird in flight shots. Does low buffer become an issue when shooting bird in flight? I love the camera's high resolution, but people are praising the A9 slash A92, high ISO and superb autofocus tracking. I'm so torn. I'd love to listen to your opinion. Thanks. I've done a lot of videos since I've gotten the A7R4 and the 600F4, and I think it does excellent for bird in flight photography. Um, I know some people are struggling with it and they have issues, but I don't for whatever reason. Um, it's my go-to camera now. Uh, as far as the buffer filling up, I have yet to hit the buffer with it either, but I'm somewhat of a conservative shooter. I don't shoot really long bursts. I think the most I'd ever done with this was like around 35 or 40, and just saying that like 99% of them were all in focus. I think it was one that was out of focus. So it's a great camera. In terms of the high ISO, probably not the best choice because it's so high res, you're gonna notice the noise a lot easier on this than say the A9. So if you're in the Sony ecosystem and you need a high ISO shot, I would shoot the A9. So low light, A9, good light, I would choose the A7R4 and I don't have any problems with the autofocus tracking. Um, I think it works great. And the next question comes from Straight Jack Studios in reference to this video here, this Colorado hummingbird. He said, how far away were you from the hummingbirds? Are you handheld or using a tripod? Sometimes the hummingbirds are right here. Seriously, they're right in your face and you gotta, you just gotta sit there and enjoy the moment. Um, other times they're, you know, they're decent ways away. I don't know, 10, 15 yards. I guess that's not too far. We always try to get as close to them as possible. And at that location um, that where this video was shot, you can do that. If you just kind of hunker down and relax, the birds come up to you and you can get really close shots. I only use the tripod mostly for video. I prefer to handhold everything, um, especially with the Sony gear because it's so small and light. Even the Nikon gear with the big 500 F4, I still prefer to handhold, but there is a time you know, when the tripod comes in handy, but most of the times it's handheld. And the next question is from Griffin Family Videos. Thank you for sharing your photographs and stories. You're so talented. The details in your pics are breathtaking. How much editing do you typically use on your photos and which editing program do you prefer? I try to do as little editing as possible because I want to be outside taking photographs. Although there is something to be said about coming back with some really good stuff 
and checking it out on your monitor and maybe fine tuning it and tweaking it a little bit. So for all of my editing, I pretty much use Lightroom all the way through everything. And then I use a few of the Topaz plugins um, at the very end of the process. And there's another question coming up where I'll answer that a little bit more. The next question comes from Susan Peasen. Gorgeous, I'm happy to see the D500 is still in your arsenal. It's the camera I own and love. I keep fantasizing about the 850, but I really can't justify an expenditure when the D500 serves me so well. Should I save up, do you think? You know, there's an old saying, um, the best camera is the one that you have in your hand. So if the D500 is serving you well, I wouldn't suggest that you update to the D850. Just keep shooting the D500. And the next question is from Pakchak Puchak. Any plans for posting something from Underwater Life? Yes, I love underwater stuff. No, I don't have the underwater gear. Right now I have a couple of phones that I can use to shoot underwater and a GoPro. I don't have any waterproof housings, don't have the strobes. Would love to do that eventually sometime down the road. And I did do one video where my son, his girlfriend and his best friend and all, uh, we all went and did a shark dive, free diving with bull sharks. You can see that here, I'll put a link to it. Go check it out. It was fun, it was scary, but it was a lot of fun. Um, so I'd like to do more of that in the future for sure. The next question is from Brandy Ganwa Photography. Hi Mark, great video. Could please you talk about how you're able to focus on the hummingbirds and do you use the D850 3D tracking at all? I do not use the 3D tracking on the Nikon systems. I found it unreliable. Um, I prefer group, uh, usually most of the time, single point, and then depending on the camera like the D850, D9, or D25, I have an entire video I made that shows how I set up and use the D850. I'll put a link to that right here so you can go watch that and see um, which ones I'd like to use and why. And the next question comes from Dano. And hey, book him, Dano. Yeah, it's a bad reference to an old TV show I liked a lot. Anyways, his question was, what focus area mode with A9 do you use for the tiny hummingbirds and bees? For about 90% of the shooting I do on all of my Sony cameras, I like the zone focus area. Um, it does wonders, uh, I, I know how to use it, I'm familiar with it, I like it. There are times when it will get you in trouble. Um, so for these smaller things, like sometimes the hummingbirds and the bees, I would use flexible spot small, which is a tiny little pinpoint like laser sight that you can put right on your subject in the sticks and in the brush and it will focus right on it. So. Again, I've got videos showing how I've set up both of my cameras, the A9 and the A7R4. I'll put links to those here. Go check those out. It kind of explains all that stuff for you. And the next question is from, I'm going to guess here, Fuzel Kareem. Mark, I am not able to wait to see your behind the scenes videos. Meantime, I need your thoughts here. I am in the middle to choose between D850 with 500 f5.6 and sony a9 with 200 to 600 am confused my subject varies from large water birds to tiny robins i do prefer to crop the image so i can see the details in them please suggest one as my mind more and more inclines towards a9 but i'm worried about f63 that's pretty easy if you prefer to crop in to see the detail you get almost twice the resolution out of the d850 so you'll get more out of the D850 in my opinion than you would with the A9 and the 200 to 600. The 500 5.6, if you're referring to the small PF lens, good luck finding it. Um, for whatever reason, you still can't get that lens. I had it for about two days. I did not like it at all and I sent it back. I think I'm the only person that didn't like it. Maybe I had a bad copy. But again, if you prefer to crop in to see detail, you'll have more resolution in the D850 than you would the A9. And this next question is from Camilla or Camilla and I. Great video. Any winner between the A9 and D850 or have they both got their merits? Not a great challenge for either camera, I presume. Both great cameras. That's a really tough question. Um, if you can fill the frame with the A9, I think it's the better choice. It's got better autofocus. It's faster. You get more frames per second. So you get images that nobody else can get those moments in between, that's really important. If you have a hard time filling the frame and you need the extra ability to crop in, then the D850 would be a better choice. Um, yeah, that's about where I sit with both of those. And the next question comes from Ron. Hey, that's an easy one. 
Hi, Mark. Which software, AID Noise or AI Sharpen, best complements your editing workflow? In other words, which software goes beyond what Lightroom or Photoshop can do? As I said earlier, I use Lightroom for most of my editing, and there's not anything that I use that goes beyond Lightroom, but there are a couple of things that I use, like Topaz Denoise. That's a permanent part of my workflow. It's the very last thing I do, and I use it on all of my images. It's fantastic. I did a review on it. Um, I'll put a link to that review here. If you haven't seen it, go check it out. And a lot of people have emailed me about that and they're bringing new life to images they took 10, 15 years ago with this software. It's pretty incredible. I don't use the Topaz Sharpen that often because most of my images are sharp to begin with. So I, I don't need it, but I have used it and it works well too. But neither one of those actually replace the functionality of Lightroom. They're just kind of an add-on that helps in the end or part of the process. The next question is from Ted K. Very informative video. I shoot high school sports, used to, and my ISO at high night games can be as high as 10,000. It must fill the frame because crops look terrible, even with a D5, but I purchased Topaz Denoise two months ago, and it's amazing to see the improvement. I run almost all of these shots through Topaz Denoise now. I always wondered how you get those extreme close-ups of the bird's eye, the iris, amazing. I live close to you, near Publix at 510 and 512, and I would like to know... The local printer that you use for metal prints. Mind sharing the business name? Thanks, Ted. I've actually had a lot of people ask me this. Um, the local printer that I use, their website is Canvas and Metal Metal Canvas and Metal Prints.com. I'm not affiliated with them in any way. Um, I just really like the work they do. I've gotten five metal prints from them. They're great. If you're local, like you said you were, they're right off of Highway 60 and 95, right over there by the hotels. Um, great work, great price. A uh, couple of local guys, father and son team. It's good. I like to go there and sometimes just talk with them. It's cool to see the whole process. So again, that's canvasandmetalprints.com. I highly recommend their product. It's fantastic. And the next question comes from Cardiacade. Is that Jared Polin in the background? I think he was probably referring to this. And no, this is not Jared Polin. This is the original Fro guy that created really good art. This is Bob Ross. If you don't know who Bob Ross is and you like photography, I highly recommend going on Netflix and checking it out because he paints these epic vistas in like 30 minute episodes that are just absolutely mesmerizing and they will teach you a lot about photography. You can learn uh, composition and light because he just does it as he says, layer by layer by layer and then you start to kind of understand how it all works. So no, this isn't Frono's photo, this is Bob Ross. So that was it for the questions in this video. Um, hopefully this will kind of stick and people start asking more and I can do it more. If it doesn't and nobody shows any interest, let's just pretend this video never existed and just move on to doing some other stuff. Thanks for sticking around to the end. If you did, um, leave me some questions in the comment section and maybe we can continue to do this. And uh, until next time, I'll see you later.